Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, focus month. Uh, today, we will have the last webinar of the biometry focus month. My name is Abdo Jamal. I'm the international sales specialist for biometry. Uh, uh, just I would like to tell you about some logistics uh, issue. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. And if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A uh, section. And uh, don't use the uh, chat, chat box. We will try to answer all these questions by the end of this uh, uh, session. I want here to welcome uh, Thomas Beutler, our uh, product manager for uh, iStar, who will talk today about how you hack your practice with iStar. So all the features of, of the iStar. Thomas is working with Hackstrike since 17 years. He's been a part of several projects in Hackstripe, starting from the imaging module to LensStar, and now with iStar. He also was a key element developing the iSuite software. Uh, he has a lot of experience with uh, biometry in, in general, and I would like to welcome him and thank him for this. So uh, welcome, Thomas, and the floor is yours. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much, Abdo. Thank you and good evening. I would like to welcome you, everybody here for this webinar, How to Hack Your Practice, all about iStar 900. <clears throat> so it's going to be basically a summary of features of the iStar and how it might be best applied to improve your practice efficacy. So let's start with a little overview and let's see what is the iStar. The iStar is not just another biometer, as you might think when you listen to the name and when you look at the model plate of Hawk Stride, where you have the lens star as the original optical biometer for the cataract application. The iStar goes far beyond that. The iStar is a swept source OCT based biometer, but also corneal topographer and corneal and anterior chamber tomographer. So it provides also images of anterior chamber with swept source OCT. It is then combined with iSuite IOL, our well-known our calculation extension for the cataract application. Said all this, you really see that this is a combination device providing applications for all different kinds of applications, starting with cataract surgery, leading to refractive, but also corneal diagnostics. That's all part of the device. So let's have a little closer look what's going to be uh, shown to you in the next few minutes. I'd like to have a few works on how this device might improve the efficacy in your workflows, how it can improve the confidence in your cataract cases, and then how the AC suite, the latest extension of the module, may support you in your corneal diagnosis and in screening for corneal diseases. So let's start with improved efficacy. Like all other devices with eyes and with yes. box, right? The iStar is powered with iSuite software. So it's one software for all of our products, which means that it integrates easily with EMR systems. And if you do the integration once, you don't have to do it a second time for another device because all runs the same way. So if you have one integration, if it runs with one of the devices, you can basically copy paste this and then off you go and it works immediately. It's also nice to have always the base, the same way the software is operated. So the learning curves for your technician, but also for yourself, is steep. You don't have to adjust to different uh, ways of thinking within the software, and it simplifies the integration in your daily practice. Another advantage of iSuite is that it's easily networked. It allows you to have a central database storage so you can access your data everywhere in your practice or even at multiple sites. This 
improves your workflows. It also allows you to delegate the data acquisition process and then use your time best to do patient counseling, patient education. And it's also a safety feature. So if a device dies, it doesn't matter because all your data is safe on your server. And this is then also part of the regular backup strategy in your practice. Another thing which helps a lot to improve the efficacy is the data acquisition. It is a fully automated data acquisition, which we have with the iStar, and a bilateral measurement usually just takes about 40 seconds. It can be done by everybody in the practice, and it also keeps the quality of the measurement steady because it is fully automated. This automation also improves the patient comfort because you don't have to move the device. The device is steady. There's no moving part outside of the device, which makes it also more relaxing for the patient. Nothing approaches his eye closely. It's all done within the box, which is self-contained and closed. And as you've seen with the video, it just runs on the bottom. It's really quick. You also get immediate feedback if the measurement acquisition was done well, and also if there would have been issues with, let's say, a closed eyelid or with an unstable tear film, then the user, the technician would have got real text feedback and also a graphical feedback to ask the patient to blink or ask the patient to open the eyes wide. Okay. All this helps you to improve the workflows and the ease of use to acquire data for all different kinds of needs. So you have the biometer for the cataractive application, you have the topographer for the corner front, the corner back, you have pachymetry, you have everything for the anterior chamber analysis. You have tomography to get images of the anterior chamber with a diameter of up to 18 millimeter, covering everything from the corner to including the crystalline lens. And because the patient doesn't have to move from one to another device, the patient comfort is improved and also the patient <clears throat> cooperation might be easier because it's less tiring and helps them to get them the measurement acquisition uh, being used as a real comfortable uh, procedure. Okay. This is about efficacy and how the iStar might help you to get more out of your practice. Now let's have a quick look at the cataract application and how the iStar may lead to more confidence, specifically for premium cases and for difficult cases. Okay. The cataract application really moved on from being the replacement of the crystalline lens and restoring vision just with respect to the opacity of the crystalline lens to become a refractive procedure. People want to have spectacle independence after cataract operation, and this really increases the demands on the preoperative assessment of the patient. In the old days, having axial length, keratometry, and maybe anterior chamber depth was sufficient. Nowadays, with multifocal lenses and and depth of field lenses with toric lenses, you need much more to be sure that your surgical outcome is going to be optimal and to get the patient expectation right, which is one of the biggest concerns nowadays that a patient knows what's going to be done to his eye and what he might expect as a result of it. <clears throat> Sorry. So with the eye star, you get all the parameters needed for a good thorough counseling of the patient in one single fully automated measurement step. So you get OCT-based axial parameter from the corner to the retina, including corneal thickness, anterior chamber depth, length thickness, and the eye length. You also get then keratometry of the corner front and back, which is of big use for torics, but also for post-refractive patients. Then you have OCT-based corner front and back topography to have a look at the astigmatism, for example, if you have a Tory candidate, but also to judge the aberrations, how much of the 
vision imperfection comes from, for example, an astigmatism, how much is related to some irregularities, some um, abnormalities like coma, and then uh, respective counseling can be done to the patient to get him the right implant. Last but not least, I would like also to mention lens tilt as an analysis to make sure the implant chosen will work in this particular patient because if you do have extensive lens tilt to start with, you might not want to go for a multifocal IOL because this lens tilt might then negatively affect the performance of the implant. What you see now here is the measurement overview after the cataract measurement acquisition. In this screen, the surgeon already has all the information at hand needed to judge which direction shall I go with this patient? Shall I go for standard monofocal implant? Is this maybe a toric candidate? Might there be some limitations for a multifocal IOL? Whatever. So what do we see here? First of all, we have on the bottom here, all the axial parameters. When you look at this patient on the right eye, 2303, standard axial length, the anterior chamber is a little bit shallow with about 3.12 millimeters, and the corneal thickness a little bit thinner than the average with 491 microns, and the length thickness about normal for the age there. Then we have on the left side, again, similar image, normal axial length, Shallow, a little bit shallow anterior chamber, a little bit thinner corner, and also quite normal length field thickness. Next parameter on display is the anterior keratometry. There we have also standard values, slight astigmatism, about one diopter. So we might consider this patient for a low power toric, and also on the left eye. If we consider a toric implant, we want to have a look at the power maps, which are also on display. And we see on both eyes, we see the bow tie, we see on the right eye, some asymmetry uh, top to bottom. And on the left eye, we see same asymmetry top to bottom, but also some nasal temporal asymmetries, which might limit the effect of a toric implant here, and which we have to consider in the counseling and in the expectation setting of the patient. Then we have the white on white, the white light image of the patient and the pupil diameter on display. And also important here, you see the OCT section of the anterior chamber in the plane of maximum lens tilt. So it's not just a horizontal cut because usually the maximum lens tilt is close to horizontal, but it's really that plane where the maximum lens tilt occurs. And we see here in this, when you look at the little schematic here that shows the orientation of the cut, that it is close to horizontal, but slightly tilted on both eyes. Watch, nothing unusual. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfectly straight. And therefore, you also have not always a horizontal line for the maximum lens tilt. But here we have it on display. And last but not least, you also see the scan on the retina. Looking at this particular patient, I can now show you also how the different additional information, piece of information which we have can help you to get the right decisions done. First, we start what swept source based OCT biometry can help and how it can be used. Here, I go for an additional example. I go for this scan. What we see here, is an A scan, like you get it from every single optical biometer out on the market, where you see just the signal to noise levels. You have here the cornea from back. You have three peaks here. We immediately see that this cannot be a crystalline lens, but it might be an IOL, but we see three peaks. And what we would expect here for a pseudophagic patients are two peaks. Then we have the retina peaks with the peak from the RPE and the ILM as in every textbook written. So let's go back here to the implant peaks. We see there's an implant and we see more peaks than expected. If I don't have additional information 
like I get from the swept source OCT with the I star, I would have to go back and look for other means to visualize this, maybe do a second scan on a different device. Now with the I star, I can immediately look at the B scan and I see implant and I see the posterior capsular back. And there's some liquid trapped between the IOL and the posterior capsular bag. And here I immediately see why this patient did experience a non-perfect result. His vision was not as good as expected because the eye was pushed by the liquid a little bit forward and I can start the respective treatment. In this case, the surgeon decided to use the YAG laser to open up the capsule bag to free the liquid which was trapped behind the IOL and the capsule bag. The IOL itself settled itself in the right position and the patient is now happy having the vision which he wanted to have before. So here you really see a case where the additional information of the beast can help to get the right treatment done to the patient. That's the overlay where we have the A scan and the B scan with the cornea, the IOL, perhaps her back, and then here, the retinal scan. Okay. Now we move on and go to OCT-based topography for the cataract application. Here again, that's what you experience from standard biometers that gives you axial length and case. You have all the parameters for the axial length. You have the case, you have the astigmatism, the axis, everything is there. We see that we have quite some astigmatism, so it might be a good toric candidate. But if I go for a premium IOL like a toric, I want to know more. I want to make sure that the astigmatism really is symmetric and formally distributed. That's the case we already looked at. We see we do have the bow tie, but we see some asymmetry superior to inferior, and we see some asymmetry nasal to temporal. Now, looking at this, I can already educate the patient, well, there is some astigmatism on your eye. We might be able to correct it, but it won't be perfect because it's not a perfect, nicely distributed and symmetrical astigmatism. We see the bending shown here by this red line. I can now move on and use the zone-based keratometry to further assess the astigmatism of this patient. The zone-based keratometry is a little bit different to standard simulated keratometry because as compared to standard keratometry where we have just two meridians always perpendicular to each other, Zone-based keratometry has up to four meridians, which are completely independent in orientation. Now, here in this particular case, in the three millimeter zone, we see that the meridians, top, bottom, as well as temporal and nasal, still show quite some good agreement with standard keratometry norms. They are almost perpendicular to each other, and um, they also show quite similar power distribution. We already see that there is some imperfection, that we have some asymmetry, but it's still in the range. For the intermediate zone, the three to five millimeter, we see that there are just two meridians left. So now we see that we don't have distinct steep and flat zones in top, bottom, temporal, nasal, but we have a more flat zone in the superior nasal part and the more steep zone in the inferior part and not four meridians as we would expect from standard topography. And the same is true for the periphery five to seven meters, millimeters. So we already see here, specifically at night with a bigger pupil, there might be issues in this vision. <coughs> Sorry. The next step is to use the Cernicke analysis and vision stimulation to show this to the patient and to again educate him on where does the visual imperfection come from. So here, that's the Cernicke tree. We see that the visceral against astigmatism is still the biggest portion of his 
version imperfection, but you also already see also that there's vertical and horizontal comma, so asymmetry, which is then the second most big part in here. So we see it won't be perfect even with correction of the astigmatism. We can also show the patient now, if we look at your vision at night with a six millimeter pupil, we can reduce the imperfection by adding a toric. That's what we do here. We take away the second order aberrations and we see vision improved, but due to the asymmetries, we still have some double images, which are from the top down and temporal nasal um, asymmetries. That's at night. So now if we reduce the pupil side and simulate day vision, we see that at day, the toric is still the biggest portion. So his astigmatism here of the visual imperfection and having a toric eye wall might improve it a lot. And that's also well aligned with what we've seen from the zone-based keratometry where the three millimeter zone showed quite some growth agreement with standard keratometry with meridians that are almost perpendicular to each other and a good power distribution on all four meridians of the zone-based keratometry. And this we can now show to the patient and he can then still decide, do I wanna invest in this improvement of my vision for day? knowing that at night it won't be perfect and there will be some remaining imperfection and then the right treatment may be chosen and everybody knows what might be expected from the result. Okay, an additional thing to mention is that the topography provided by the iStar fits with type A standard topography, so it is a real topographer. It has corner front, corner back topography in the cataract suite. It covers seven and a half, seven and a half millimeter, so basically standard for all kinds of applications. And it also offers you pachymetry. So you have corner front, corner back topography, and pachymetry, everything in one single measurement process. You get the Zernike analysis with the operation profile to see what part of the corner shows what imperfection. You have the vision simulation and the zone-based keratometry to again have a judgment, is this a suitable candidate for a toric or not? Okay. Last but not least, we have a look at the analysis of the lens tilt. The lens tilt is analyzed as said, really in the plane of the maximum tilt of the lens. As usual, it's close to horizontal, but not 100% horizontal. That's why they decided to really segment the whole complete entire lens and then look for the maximum lens tilt. And we then show it in the infrared image taken from keratometry, where the cut is located, showing the cut itself, and then also showing the decentration of the lens with respect to the pupil and the apex. So we have this information available for the crystalline lens, but we can do the same thing also for an implanted IOL. So we have the information before the operation to see is this a candidate with quite normal physiological lens tints between three to five degrees, where a multifocal implant would be easily implantable, or is there some extensive lens tilt where there might be issues with it? And if we have a post-op surprise, we might assess, might this surprise come from an unusual configuration of the IOL after implantation, which might also be related to extensive implant tilt. Okay, so that's all what you can get out of the cataract suite, and it really provides you with all the results needed to make the good judgment what implant might lead to the best outcome for a particular patient. Next section, which I would like to talk to you about is the AC suite, the OCT-based corneal diagnosis support. What do we get there? So with 
AC suite, you get extended corneal topography. As mentioned before, the cataract suite provides you with corneal coverage of 7.5 millimeters, which is already suitable for most applications. But in some cases, you need a little bit more. You might want to have the extra out to 12 millimeter covering the entire cornea. There are specific anomalies, keratoconus one or pellucid marginal degeneration that happen more peripheral and the additional few millimeters which we cover there might be of benefit to get a better clinical judgment on the cornea there. We do this on the cornea front, on the cornea back, you get pachymetry with it as well. So you have the full image, which you also know from standard topography, which usually provide you with a 12 millimeter coverage. What you also get in the anterior chamber suite are the standard tool set, which you already know from AC analyzers all or from topographers, where you have different views, trend views in maps, as well as in parameters. In the I-star, it looks like follow. You have the four in one view, where you have two maps side by side, as well as the respective parameters from the simulated keratometry and from the pachymetry. You can select <clears throat> the maps on display from the list of all measurements by drag and dropping or from a pull down. And you can then also select what map you would like to have on display from a pull down menu with all the maps available. So it's axial curvature, tangential curvature, with, which is the elevation, standard elevation, best fit sphere, or with a best fit toric. Then you also have the pachymetry map available. So you can look at it side by side with the parameters also available at the same time. The next comparative view is the difference table view, we call this. There we do compare the measurement A with measurement B, and we provide the difference of A minus B on the parameters, simulated keratometry as well as pachymetry, as well as on a map. Now here it's right now the axial curvature map, and you could also adjust the map on display on the pull down menu on the right side where the parameters are and then select any of the other maps on display. So it's a quick thing. You can again select the measurements to be compared either from the list on the left with the little icons and drag and drop them or from the pull downs on top of the columns. Last but not least, you can do the same thing also with just maps to have a bigger representation of the difference. And there we can have a look at three different um, data sets. It could be time points or um, other comparisons. So here we have three time points of the same patient and we see the difference map of A minus B and then B minus C down there. And we can select the map on display in the difference view again from the pull down menu an easy intuitive tool to show you progression, for example, in the axial curvature or also in any other parameter on display as a map. A new feature which is just about to be rolled out is the progression view, which is fully customizable. So every parameter which is on display in iSuite can be shown as a progression view. You can select if you want to have the parameter on display either as a line plot or a bar plot. You can select if you want to have the right and the left eye independent or if you want to have them merged in one plot. Here we see an example where, for example, the anterior maximum curvature, so K max, is on display as well as the thinnest corneal point. Uh, they are both line plots here and then in the second line. Uh, it uses the parameters from the ABCD keratoconus grading by Berlin, which are on display. And you see how these parameters changed while with this patient was measured several times. Another new addition to the AC suite is the coronal extasia display, which we just added in the latest release to be rolled out um, in the next few days. <clears throat> The corneal extension screen is again a summary of different maps and parameters, and it's again fully customizable. 
On the left side, you have four maps, which can be selected by pull down menus. What you see here is just an example where you have on top the best fit sphere for the anterior elevation and the posterior elevation. Here we see a keratoconus case. Then on the second line, we have here selected elevation where a central zone of three millimeters excluded around the thinnest point of the corner. And we already see the advantage of this exclusion area that ecstatic areas of the corner are highlighted. So if you look at the top elevation map, we see looks like an astigmatism, no big thing. Also on the posterior corner, there's a slight hotspot here, but it's not something you would immediately jump on. If you then look at the second line where we have the elevation with three millimeter exclusion zone for the best fit sphere around the thinnest point of the corner, we see that this ecstatic change here is much more prominent on the posterior corner and also on the anterior corner, we see the beginning of the cone of this patient. We have then on the top right here, the pachymetry analysis with the progression of the pachymetry from the thinnest point to the periphery. We have the meridian of the maximum change, the maximum increase in corneal thickness, and we have the meridian of the minimal increase of the corneal thickness. We have then also display of the corneal thickness spatial profile. This is basically how the cornea increases in thickness on average on the overall cornea from the thinnest point to the periphery. And what you see here immediately is that this cornea is in the thinnest point thinner than usual. It's just 431 microns thin. And we see that the blue line, which is the overall increase, um, is approaching the standard line of a healthy population down here. So it is progressing faster, it's becoming thicker faster than a standard cornea. On the second line here, we have same view basically, but now just relative. So it's just a percentage thickness increase of the cornea from the thinnest point again to the periphery. And we see that it increases its thickness much faster than a standard healthy population. And the dotted line here are the 95% confidence interval from normals. We, oops, sorry. We also have the pachymetry values, the thinnest point and the pachymetry progression index there, the minimum, the mean and the maximum. With a normal eye, you would expect these values to be close to one. Here we have a set a keratoconus patient on display. And we see that the PPI mean is really elevated at 2.86. In this case, the minimum is 1.8, the maximum is 3.84. And we see also that these values are higher than normal. Another sign that there might be something going on is cornea. On the right side, just beside the pachymetry values, we have the ABCD staging by Berlin. That's the anterior radius of curvature in the three millimeter zone around the thinnest point. Same for the posterior radius of curvature, and then the thinnest point of the corner. And this leads to staging from zero upwards, and zero would be a healthy corner, and then it starts with grade one, two, three, four, and so forth for the keratoconus. Last but not least, you also have the simulated keratometry down here with Kmax and the standard values, and the um, the corneal shape factor down here. Okay, when we look at this, that's basically just a summary of what I just told you. We have the maps, which can be customized, which can be adjusted to the user's need and can be stored. So Dr. A might wanna have, instead of elevation maps on top, he might wanna have uh, anterior corneal curvature, posterior corneal curvature, and then other maps on the bottom. We can save this as Dr. A and then have a different setup for Dr. B and so forth. This really summarizes everything you need to make a good judgment on the corneal status of the patient.
The next thing I would like to talk to you is the OCT imaging, the OCT based tomography. We are capable to take images everywhere on the 18 millimeter scan volume, which has been acquired on the patient. And this can be done after the patient left. That's a unique feature of the iStar as compared to other OCT engines, where you always have to rescan if you wanna have an additional section. iStar can create these OCT sections after the patient has left. We can do radial scans, but also line scan stacks. And we can do single scans freehand. So basically you select the yellow line, move it to the location you want to have it, and then the respective B scan is displayed. And the advantage really here is that you don't have to rescan the patient if the OCT section doesn't show the area which you want to show to start with. So it's an advantage here again, it's more convenient for you, it's easier to do and saves time, improves your efficacy. It also allows you to take measurements in these B scans. You can do point-to-point -point measurements now, you can do angular measurements and you can do area measurements in these cross sections to also quantify what you see in the OCT image. And this is done in the 18 millimeters scan volume acquired on the cornea. So you see really that we have the entire eye covered from eyelid to eyelid here, or here we also see the same thing in the radial scan. How can we do this, that we do a scan and then create the B scans after the patient left? This is based on the mandala scanning, which we are using. So the iStar doesn't use standard radial scans as most other devices, but he uses a scan technology called mandala scanning. This is a circular scan pattern that covers the entire eye with the imaging mode up to 18 millimeter. In the cataract suite, it's seven and a half, and in the AC suite for topography applications, 12 millimeters. And the advantage of this is that we have an even distribution of the scan points in the center, but also in the periphery. In the center, it's more dense, but it doesn't thin out like standard radial scans to the periphery. It's much more even. We also have many intersections, as you can see here in this image. So we can do the compensation of the patient's motion right in the OCT scan. And how is this done? So we have high density, we have density in the center, but also in the periphery, we have mon many intersections, and this continuous scanning allows us then to do virtual B scans, biometry, and also topography at once. We do this, we do the scan, we do segment the corner, we do the motion compensation in this cloud of points, and then we do biometry, SIMK, topography, and imaging afterwards. The motion compensation gives us another advantage. It's not only providing us with crispy images, as we can see here on the left, that's a non-motion compensated image. On the right, it is motion compensated, but it also increases our density of the scans. Again, on the left, you see how the scan looks like before the motion compensation. We see the crystal clear scan pattern with the trajectories. If we then move the points to where they should have been, applying the motion compensation, the scan pattern becomes even denser. And this allows us to really have then good B scans throughout the entire scan volume there. Okay. Now let's move on. The iStar really is a precise, fully automated web source OCT ice analyzer for all the applications from anterior segment analysis to cataract and refractive surgery. You get all the data you are looking for in one single measurement process in a small footprint device. It's self-contained. Everything is within the device. There's no need to have 
PC beside it, so it also fits into small rooms. It, it allows you to move the screen from the side, as you've seen in this presentation, to the back or to the opposite side, depending on the needs of your practice. Therefore, it basically can be set up everywhere and suited to the respective space, space um, available. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm now here to answer your questions. Thank you, Thomas, for the nice presentation. It looks like the iStar has all what an interior chamber specialist, specialist needs. So I have a few questions here. A question is about what is the normal range of lens tilt? Normal range of lens tilt is around three to five degrees. Um, where there should be a cutoff to say, well, I still go for a premium multifocal IOL or not, that's really a surgeon's preference. Some surgeons say, oh, well, I still go up to five degrees or some go even a little bit higher, but it's really then the surgeon preference. But looking at the standard data, it's around three to five degrees, which is standard lens tilt. That's physiological. That's what you can expect from a standard patient. Okay. The other question is also about the lens tilt. Is it possible to have more tilt after the IOL implantation? Yes, that's possible. There have been studies done on <coughs> different devices before the iStar was available there. And the correlation between the preoperative and the postoperative lens tilt was shown. So if there is some tilt before, there will be also some tilt afterwards. But it's not 100% strong, so it's not 100% true that if you have extensive lens tilt, that this will also be true for the IOL. It might decrease, but it might also increase. So there's a lot of noise. Where this noise comes from, if it is due to the tension in the capsule back, how the IOL is actually tightening the sonlos or whatever, has not yet been assessed. And there will be more studies done in the future that shows us how well the iStore can then show a correlation between pre-op and post-op. We know that there is some correlation. If there is tilt, it will be there afterwards as well. But if it's going to be bigger, smaller, or the same, this cannot be predicted very well yet. Okay, so now we have the tool to do these studies and maybe improve the tilt if, if they find, find something. Correct. Okay. Uh, a question is about the K readings. Why don't we use the same K instead of the reflective Ks when, when we do the IOL calculations? Okay, good. I mean, as you realize, or as this person that raises the question, we do have simulated keratometry from the OCT. And why did we add the reflective keratometry, which is tear film dependent, and we all know that in cataract patients, tear film is usually an issue. Well, it's pretty simple. When you do keratometry with reflective keratometry, you have the keratometry principle inherently in the measurement process because you apply a shape to the reflection, which has a flat and a steep meridian and you try to do a best fit. Best fit in orientation and in flat and steep meridian to fit the reflections on the cornea. So you have the principle in there and you just look at the area where the reflections are. If you do the same thing on the OCT topography or any other standard topography, doesn't really matter what the technology is behind it, it's a multi-step procedure. You first start with elevation maps, so height curvature, height information basically. Looks like a topography map from a standard geographic map where you see mountains with height lines. Then on this elevation map, you do a reconstruction of the surface. And on this reconstruction, you then apply again a simulated keratometry. Now this keratometry is also influenced by peripheral effects on the core of the cornea, which might not show in a standard reflective keratometry. So in average, and also on a pretty 
usual cornea, the sim case and the reflective case may fit 100%. And in average, they fit everywhere. But on the individual cases, because of some corneal imperfection, maybe in the periphery, there might be significant difference between a reflective K and a sim K. And what we found is that all the well calculation for me were derived on reflective case, and the reflective case showed really stable results for the anterior surface in the past, and they were more stable and showed better results in uh, comparative studies. That's why we added the reflective keratometry for the cataract application with the eye star. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I have a question, but it seems a little bit like comparing our or the I star device with the anterior. What mm -hmm. are, I don't know if I understood you, SP unique selling points or, yeah, what mm -hmm. are the advantages uh, of I star okay. versus the anterior? As compared to anterior. Okay, I mean, the anterior and the I star they are very similar devices. They're both swept source OCT devices looking at the cornea, but also at the cataract application. And if you look at the feature set of the two devices, they are very, very similar. You have on both devices, topography on both devices, biometry on both devices, tomography, meaning imaging. The biggest difference is usability wise. The anterior is a fully manual device. The I star is fully automated, which means that if you do take the measurement with the I star, it's always the same procedure. It's fully automated. So user experience, user training doesn't play any role there. It's always the same. That might be an advantage. Uh, another difference is that the anterior only has simulated keratometry. And just by the reason I just explained, this might be for the cataract application a bit less perfect than having for the anterior case reflective keratometry. But there also studies will show which one performs better in the end. But as said before, there's always a little difference between sim case and reflective case. And we decided to have the reflective keratometry there to have the gold standard for the cataract application. Okay, thank you, Thomas. I think I don't have any more questions. Uh, I want to thank everybody for watching uh, this uh, webinar. And uh, just for your information, all the videos from this year's uh, Focus Month will be on, uh, on a YouTube channel. And we promise that we will organize another Focus Month next year. And we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for your time and looking forward to see more of you next year. Thank you very much. All the best.